Peter Poyes was chief organizer. He compiled and closely guarded a list of enlisted men, or candidates as they called them. We must break the yoke. God has his hand in this, Peter reminded his recruits. A ship carpenter by trade, Peter was a natural general with bona fide leadership skills. He compiled a list of all Charleston shops that kept and sold arms and ammunition. It was said that once Peter got his eye on you, there was no resisting his command. Gullah Jack was thought to possess supernatural powers, a magical priest, a conjurer. When taken from his native Angola, he was allowed to take with him a bag. This bag was his conjuring sack, and he never parted with it. He was a skilled root doctor, creator of medicines and poisons if the situation required such. Gullah Jack was also a master of deception. To whites, he flawlessly played the role of harmless and happy. To his fellow enslaved comrades, he was known to be an invincible force and was called the little man who cannot be killed. Gullah's reputation among field workers was critical to recruitment efforts. The night of the attack, Gullah Jack would hand out crab claws to be held in the mouth. The claws would provide protection from injury and harm. Philip was Gullah Jack's right hand. He was a preacher and blind. Philip took care of recruitment when Gullah Jack was engaged in other duties. Philip had the uncanny ability to see into the heart and soul. This skill endeared him to many who needed a nudge to take on the seemingly insurmountable task ahead. Monday Gell was enslaved and literate. He would serve as the scribe and like Gullah Jack, a native of Africa. Monday wrote a letter to President Boyer of Haiti. He sought assurance that the people of Haiti would help their efforts to free themselves. Tom Russell was in charge of the arms, making pikes and securing other weapons. Polydor Faber also readied weapons for battle. Together, they would put together hundreds of pikes and daggers, reserving swords and guns for the commanders. Bacchus Hammett was solely in charge of firearms and ammunition. Guns were allegedly to be secretly stored in coffins around the city. William Garner and Mingo Hearth were to lead a company of horsemen. Lot Forrester was the messenger, spreading word and details of the uprising. Ned Bennett was to act as a commander. He was the governor's trusted servant and had access to inside information in terms of what the official response to an uprising might be. Originally, the uprising was to take place on July 14, 1822, Bastille Day, the anniversary of the French Revolution. But since there was a leak in the plot, no matter how slight, Denmark decided to launch his attack on the city earlier, June 16. Look sharp, it's time. At the stroke of midnight, Peter Poyas would command a force on horseback. They'd scour the streets, securing vital avenues while clearing away any resistance. Yeah, yeah. He volunteered to capture the city's main guardhouse. At the same time, another group, led by Ned Bennett, would seize the arsenal, securing much needed firearms. A third group, led by Rolla, would kill the governor and mayor, and then take up strategic locations on the edge of the Charleston city limits, preventing white forces from assembling and entering the city. A fourth group would descend upon the wharf and attack the upper guardhouse. A fifth group would assemble two and a half miles from the city and seize a large store of gunpowder. A sixth would gather at Denmark VC's house and take orders if any part of the plan needed adjustment. And a seventh group, led by Gullah Jack, would meet at the head of King Street and systematically conduct an arms raid, hitting previously identified stores and shops. Simultaneously, 
a free roaming horse brigade led by William Garner and Mingo Hart, who would patrol the streets, killing any and all who dared to interfere with the capturing of Charleston. All the while, reinforcements by the thousands would pour into the city from plantations in the country. Possibly entire plantations had been enlisted. They would come by way of the Ashley and Cooper Rivers, routes they frequently used when bringing agricultural products into Charleston. Once the city was secure, the liberated African revolutionaries could set sail for Haiti, the young republic that had thrown off the shackles of slavery just a few years before. They would be waiting with open arms. As Charleston lay asleep and unsuspecting, and within hours of go time, more leaks appeared in what had previously been an almost impervious plan. Out of a mixture of torture, fear, and promises of freedom came a deluge of information about the would-be plan for freedom, mostly from the mouths of enslaved people. In rapid succession, the supposed lieutenants in the plot were arrested and taken into custody. After a two-day manhunt, Denmark B.C. himself was taken into custody. The trial of the conspirators began on Wednesday, June 19th, 1822, just three days after the intended date of the revolution. No spectators were permitted at trial, owners and counsel of the enslaved only. Court proceedings took place in a small room and no black person, free or enslaved, was allowed within two miles of the prison. 5,000 troops stood guard day and night. In all, 131 men were arrested in connection to the plot. By all accounts, the ringleader showed not a hint of fear, remarkably composed. When Peter Poyas was asked how it was possible that he could wish to see his master and family murdered, after they had treated him so kindly, Peter's only response was a smile. When the sentence of death was finally handed down, Peter said matter-of-factly, I suppose you'll let me see my wife and family before I die. A handful of enslaved witnesses, which included Monday Gell, unfolded stories of the plot to the court, implicating their fellow enslaved brethren. Gullah Jack offered hard stares and mysterious hand gestures. Catching the attention of the judge, Jack was told to refrain from casting any bewitching spells on witnesses. Acting as his own defense counsel, Denmark continued with righteous indifference. Only after the judge chastised Denmark for bringing such harm and destruction to his followers did he show any sign of emotion. Tears filled his eyes. Of the 131 arrested, 67 were convicted, including four white men. For the 35 were sentenced to death by hanging. The sentence to death by hanging. May God have mercy on The first six souls. were executed on July 2nd, 1822, three of whom had been enslaved by Governor Bennett. Taking a place on the scaffold with them was Peter Poyas and Denmark Vesey. Only Peter spoke. Do not open your lips, die silent, as you shall see me do. All obeyed. By August 9th, the last of the 35 conspirators had been executed. Anyone in Charleston thought to be mourning the dead conspirators would be whipped. The law recommended no more than 39 lashes. Following the court cases, laws tightened in South Carolina slave owners could no longer free their enslaved property without the approval of the state legislature. All free Africans were assigned a white guardian, someone to vouch for their good character. If a free African left the state, they could not return. The Negro Seamen Act stated that all black sailors must be confined to prison while their ship was at port. The African Church of Charleston was burned, and to ensure the public safety in the event of future slave uprisings, a fortress was built. It was called the Citadel. 
the Denmark VC plot failed to secure the freedom of the enslaved people of South Carolina, but placed the nation on the path to civil war. Northern abolitionists praised the name Denmark VC and hailed him as a symbol of the abolitionist cause. To many Southerners, the name conjured up every fear associated with black liberation. The misguided notion that blacks were content, even thankful with their position at the bottom of society, had been shattered. If one only dared to look, the truth had always been just below the surface. <laughs>